All right, I think uh, we should get started. Um, want to welcome everybody to the Midas seminar on this Thanksgiving week. Um, just want to, before I introduce today's speaker, um, just want to tell you about next week's uh, seminar. Um, we have uh, uh, our next seminar on December 7th. Um, and that's uh, Xiao Chan Jiang from the University of Texas Health Science Center. Uh, is gonna talk about uh, biomedical uh, data science. On December 14th, we have Eric Shing from Carnegie Mellon University uh, who uh, does work on AI, natural language, uh, information retrieval, things like this. On December 21st, we have Stan Ehalt from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, who has been uh, the major force behind setting up data science efforts at UNC and uh, is also himself uh, interested in health sciences, medical science, uh, applications of data science. Uh, so I hope to see you at all of these uh, seminars. Uh, and uh, with a quick uh, thank you to our many sponsors, uh, I'd like to go on to welcome today's speaker. We have uh, very few internal speakers amongst our galaxy of uh, invited talks and uh, really, really delighted uh, that Stuart Soroka is uh, one of the, one of these very few. Uh, he is uh, Michael Trauga Collegiate Professor in Communication and Media uh, in Political Science and uh, a senior Research Fellow at the Center for Political Studies in ISR. Um, he has uh, been a major force in uh, analyzing uh, political opinion. And uh, he has uh, done some really fantastic work that uh, I'm eager to hear about, I, I don't want to uh, give away what my perspective on uh, my, my semi understanding of, of the work is, but um, I, I think that, that that is really fantastic and I am sure you'll, you'll all agree. So um, without further ado, uh, Stuart, please tell us about tracking the mood of uh, the US from media coverage. We'll do so. Thanks very much. I'm going to just going to try to share my screen before we get further here. Okay, I'm assuming that you're all uh, that you're all looking at my slides, uh, and what you're seeing is a black slide that says tracking the mood of US media coverage. Yes. If that's not what you're looking at, then I hope somebody will send me a note. <laughs> no, you look, it looks great. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, Jag, for, uh, for your kind introduction. And thank you for uh, allowing me to present this preliminary work today. Uh, it's preliminary in many different ways, as you're about to see. It, it's, um, I, I have no results. I have lots of lines, and I have some things that I'm going to call concurrent validity tests rather than results, uh, although the results may look a lot like those concurrent validity tests. For now, I'm just like a little nervous about it, and so I'm calling them concurrent validity tests. And, uh, and, and here's why I'm a, uh, a little bit nervous about it. Uh, the objectives of this project are pretty broad. What we have now is access, what we all have now, is access to heaps and heaps and heaps of text uh, content in news and otherwise. And this access to news content at a level that is so much greater than at a magnitude that is so much greater than we've ever seen before, allows us to explore the nature of news content and the relationship between news content and public attitudes and reality in ways that we used to never be able 
to do, right? So we're used to, you know, my line of work, at least we're, we're used to taking, by used to, I'm talking about in the late 1990s, used to taking random draws of news content and human coding them and trying to, uh, you know, make some pretty heroic assumptions about the representativeness of those data uh, relative to the actual population of news content. But now we can nearly work, nearly, work with the population of news content. We can grab almost, and I'll get back to why it's almost, almost all the content published in a major paper or several major papers. And we can use some relatively simple automated techniques to examine uh, the topics. Uh, for instance, many of you will have done far more topic modeling than I have or the sentiment of that content. And here we're focused on the, I wanna talk about the sentiment of that content. And we're interested in tracking essentially the, the mood or sentiment of news content over a roughly 30 year period. Although I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna end up focusing on 2002 onwards eventually. But for now, let's look at the whole uh, 30 year period. And we're gonna explore changes in the tone of that content. Has news coverage become more or less positive uh, or negative over time? Uh, how, are there kind of systematic changes that correspond to the state of the real world or not? These are some questions that we have floating around in our minds. And by we, I mean myself and Michael Traugott and Gavin uh, Ploger. Uh, we're interested in differences across newspapers. I'm gonna look at three newspapers today, three major papers, but um, th there are some interesting differences between those papers. And I'm not really sure yet why they, those differences exist. We're gonna explore a little bit why those differences might exist and what it might uh, be like to be a reader of, for instance, the Wall Street Journal rather than a reader of the Washington Post. We can start to get a sense for that. Not just like what it would like to be a reader of those newspapers tomorrow, but what it would like be like to be a reader of those newspapers for the past 30 years. How your, your, how your view of reality might vary from one newspaper to the other. These are the kinds of questions that are floating around in our minds. And then of course, what the relationships are between news content and public attitudes, a whole range of public attitudes. Today, we're gonna um, I'm going to focus just very briefly on the relationship between this kind of general new mood of news content and a kind of general public mood, the sense that the U.S. is going in the right direction or the wrong direction. We're going to play with some of we're going to play with some of that today. But that's just the beginning of what one could do if one was able to reliably estimate the sentiment of some uh, understandable corpus. Ideally, a population, but an, like a known population of news content over uh, an extended period. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how we did that. Uh, and, and then I'm going to show you some initial results. And then I'm going to hope in the course of questions that uh, you solve all my problems. And I'm going to try to go a little short rather than long today um, because I'm really interested in um, people's reactions to the data, what you think I'm doing right, what you think we're doing wrong, what you think the possibilities are. I want to make sure we have lots of time for that. And so uh, my interest in that and my, ability, my my tendency to talk quickly anyway are, I hope, going to lead to a shorter rather than longer presentation. I'm going to talk about where the data come from. Uh, we actually started this project using a totally different data source. So we started this project using the uh, Nexus Uni database. This is the what LexisNexis, what the news component of LexisNexis became over the past few years. And, and we were using API access to Nexus Uni that allowed us to do kind of large scale downloads up to 350,000 articles in principle uh, in off peak hours. So we could run scripts at night and scrape content. I say 350,000 in principle because in practice it was much more limited. There are other data constraints. So it took about a summer to download two, 30 years of two newspapers, the New York Times and the Washington Post. And at the end of that summer of downloading, uh, Nexus Uni stopped carrying the Washington Post. Uh, that was a problem for us because we we're interested in the series going forward. We're interested in kind of creating a database which can be updated monthly. So we could play monthly with shifts in media tone, for instance. And so, for, and so Nexus Uni became problematic for us. And we switched over to this to the ProQuest TDM uh, studio system, where, where the relevant difference differences are as follows. We now have access to the Wall Street Journal as well, which is uh, terrific from our perspective. But also, uh, the all of the content analysis now is done on their server 
not through downloads to our system. So, so long as we maintain our subscription to ProQuest, uh, you, we have, uh, and anyone who has the subscription, has uh, access to a ton of news content. And without all of the delays that come with the need to download it, just with the delays that come with like fighting with programming on a server online, which can be a bit of a, a bit of a fight, but it means that we were able to, over the course of just one or two months, catch up and rebuild um, uh, a system that would basically scrape all of the content from these three newspapers, assign sentiment to every single one of those articles, and then aggregate those articles in different ways over time. And that's what we're going to play with today. We don't actually want to do all the content in the newspapers. I think there's probably something interesting to say about what, uh, what the sentiment of an entire newspaper is, including the classifieds and the letters to the editor and editorials and the arts and leisure section, like what it's like to, um, what, the in, what the information would be like if what you did was take the entire newspaper in. I think there, there, there are reasons for communication scholars to be interested in that. But we're interested here mainly in the part of the newspaper that we view as being most responsive and perhaps um, also uh, effective, as in causally effective, uh, where political communication is concerned and where public um, attitudes, particularly where politics is, are, are concerned. Is. And so uh, what we've tried to do is isolate the parts of the newspaper that uh, I would characterize as U.S. focused Section A news, and, and that's a little bit complicated because, as we, you all, as we all know, newspapers are not all structured in the same way, and they don't all have exactly the same sections. Uh, and so, defining the like right population to work with, and then identifying that population, is complex. Defining the population is a, a function of the complexity of the structure of newspapers, and and then identifying that is a is made complex because actually the metadata stored by four different newspapers across different full text services is a, is a little different, and so we have to triangulate. We have to use a combination of page numbers. When a page number has an A in it, it's section A. We we're calling that section A. We're using section headings. Sometimes a section is called section A, and then we can use that um, use that heading. Sometimes we're using column headings. The column headings, for instance, can are useful in identifying editorials as opposed to not editorials. And so we have a combination of uh, essentially just simple grep searches of, uh, of, of a column of page numbers and a column of section headings and a, col and a column of column headings trying to triangulate unique to each newspaper and varying over time as the structure of newspapers changes over time, what we're calling US focused Section A news. Now I've only talked about the Section A news part of it. To get to the US focus part of it, we have to use a, a different, uh, uh, we have to use a search, uh, just a full text search uh, looking for all foreign countries. Now there are other ways of doing this. Sometimes a newspaper has a foreign desk and that foreign desk is listed in a column but sometimes a newspaper does not. And so we have to come up with some kind of decision rule based on just the number of times a foreign country is mentioned in an article. So the decision rule that we're gonna to use today, though note that the results do not change fundamentally if we move the, this decision, this kind of cutoff up and down. The decision rule today is if a foreign country is mentioned two or fewer times in an article, then we're calling that a US focused article. And if a foreign country is mentioned three or more times, then we're taking that article. And although it might be section A, it's not US focused and it's not part of our population. Now, there are lots of reasons to be worried about that rule, which is why that we've run all kinds of diagnostic tests, diagnostic tests, sliding that number upwards and downwards to see what difference it makes. It turns out it makes relatively little difference. It turns out that when you aggregate sentiment across hundreds of thousands of news articles, including the international stuff or not, barely matters. But there may come a time when, or, or there may be specific moments when it starts to matter. And, and so we still think it's important to identify, uh, identify that content. We're going to identify economic news also using full text keyword searches because we want to separate out the economic news from the not economic news. When we talk about Section A news, US focused Section A news, that's going to include economic stuff. But 
we, we want to take that economic stuff and also pull it out of section a because we're going to play with it a little and see the extent to which it relates to the economy and there's a uh, whereas there's a relatively limited literature on on what the sentiment of news is there is a considerable literature on what the sentiment of economic news is and so we can run a bunch of useful replications uh, if we're able to identify economic news. And we just use some very simple economic keywords. Today, we're going to use the thinnest possible version. It's actually not all economic news. We're going to play with a series that is just economic, uh, just news meant talking about employment, employment, unemployment, jobs, jobless. I think that's the entire dictionary. And basically, if an article mentions those words two or more times, we're going to call those economic words and we're going to make a series of, we're going to call those economic articles. We're going to make a series just of those articles. Again, this is a threshold that is entirely subjective, based on experience and reading, but uh, entirely subjective. And so we we play with that threshold uh, a little bit. We're also going to identify editorials where possible. The idea that editorials would be the toughest part of uh, of the analysis did not occur to me when we started. It is hands down the toughest part. I, I can't identify editorials in the New York Times at all. Not even a bit. There's a window in the Washington Post when I can't identify editorials. They don't seem to have consistently have metadata that indicates that this is an editorial or not. So that might mean that editorials are finding their way into Section A news. It might be that editorials are somewhere else. Right now, I simply cannot tell, at least for the New York Times. For the other two papers, I can tell. I can always tell with Washington, Wall Street Journal. I can mostly almost, always tell with the Washington Post, and that'll have to do for now. We're going to sentiment code all the all the articles using uh, the Lexicoder Sentiment Dictionary as implemented in the Quantita package in R. It's very easy for anyone to implement. You would you, you so long as you have the Quantita package in R, you can do it, and you can do it in many other packages too. Uh, and it's easily implementable in Python or whatever other language you would like to run it in. The, it's just a word list, and the word list is readily available. It uses what in my field would be called a bag of words approach to measuring sentiment in text, as in it does not pay any attention to where the words are in the article. Just consider the words in an article a bag of words. And in that bag of words, the Lexicoder Sentiment Dictionary is going to look for roughly 3,000 words that are positive, as in it has a list of 3,000 positive words and a list of 3,000 negative words. And we're just going to make a count of all the positive words, and we're going to make a count of all the negative words, and we're going to use that to assign sentiment. There are other tools that do similar things. For the most part, sentiment dictionaries, uh, when we aggregate this much, sentiment dictionaries produce pretty similar trends. Uh, in some, at least the test that I've done, the Lexicoder Sentiment Dictionary comes out a little ahead of other existing sentiment dictionaries when we race it against human coding, but only a little ahead. Uh, and of course, if we were able to do some more complex sentiment coding using machine learning and human codes, we would do a little bit better. We should do a little bit better. It tends to only be a little bit better. Um, but uh, we should do a little bit better because, of course, when we do human coding and then we build a machine to replicate that human coding, we usually do that human coding in the corpus that we're trying to analyze. So we would take from this corpus a subset, which we would human code, and then use a machine to, uh, to learn that human coding. That's different from a dictionary that is a kind of general purpose tool. Right? A dictionary isn't built for this corpus. This dictionary was built and tested on news content generally, and we are looking at news content generally here, but it isn't designed for this particular corpus, this particular period. It's just a bag of words based on, you know, assembled from, um, actually from, a, from some past dictionaries and using a thesaurus and using a bunch of human coding. Um, but it's a general purpose tool. It's, not, it's never gonna be quite as good as a corpus specific instrument still when you aggregate this much data over time, um, so long as the error is random, and it tends to be, uh, then we get basically the same, the same series. So just to give you a sense for the kinds of things we're counting, for those of you that haven't done sentiment analysis before, though I do have a sense that I'm speaking to an audience with much more expertise in this than I, but uh, some examples from the Lexicoder Sentiment Dictionary, absurd, betrayed, died, futile, inadequate, pointless, short-sighted, unfavorable, positive words, amiable, correct, favorable, heroic, paradise, rejoice, savvy, succeed. These are not words that necessarily are common in news content, all of them, 
but some of them are relatively common in news content. And they all tend to be reliably positive when they occur or reliably negative when they occur. The exception would be when they're negated, not absurd, not correct. And the, the way that Lexicode or Sentiment Dictionary is implemented here is we, we take out negations. Actually, what we do is we count all the positive words, we count all the negated positive words, and then we subtract the negated ones from the positive ones. So basically we have a dictionary where every word is preceded by not, or with the, with the prefix, in, in some cases, with the prefix un or non in front of it, where, whatever is relevant for that word. So we count up the positive words, we count up the negated positive words, the positive words minus the negated positive words is the real number of non-negated positive words. And we do the same for negative words. We're basically counting the non-negated negative words. And then we take those two quantities the positive word quantity and the negative word quantity, and we stick it in this very simple measure of net sentiment. Uh, so this is um, th this is a uh, I want to say a standard approach. It's a relatively common approach. The advantage of this approach is that uh, it, it actually doesn't need the word count, which when you're working with a huge pile of data, um, estimating the word, well, counting the word count actually takes a lot of processing time. And this measure tends to be very, very strongly uh, correlated with, with the other standard measure, which would be positive words minus negative words divided by word count. So this, this measure, like the other one, gives you a measure of sentiment that is essentially weighted for the size, uh, weighted for the size of the article. And this is just a, a simple empirical logic, uh, slightly smooth uh, towards zero. We add 0.5 so that we don't have zeros above or below um, the equation. And you can see here, pause is the number of positive words minus negated positive words. Neg is the number of negative words minus negated negative words. And the, the end result, net sentiment for individual article I is gonna be positive when that article is positive and negative when that article is negative and zero when that article is neutral. And we're not actually gonna look here at any individual article I. What we're going to do is we're going to take next sent we're going to take that measure net sentiment for article i and we're going to average monthly over the entire time period we don't have to our average monthly of course you can average you can look at individual articles but you can do a really interesting actually very noisy but also interesting specific periods daily time series or weekly time series you can look at it monthly quarterly however you like we're going to aggregate here monthly just to start to get a sense for uh for what the data look like Here's what the data look like. Uh, what you're looking at here are circles. Uh, the circles are the, are the monthly averages. And then the black line is a five month rolling average going through those, going through those monthly averages. It's a rolling centered average. And you, it's a little easier to see the trend with that, with that black line, of course. And what you see here is basically the tone of the entire section A of the Wall Street Journal over the past 30 years. And uh, what this looks like uh, to, to me, at least, is there are a few uh, punctuated moments of negativity. The two most negative moments here are about where we would expect them to be, 9-11 and then the Great Recession. Okay, so you have a, uh, a largely, let's call it a happy period. I don't know that that's what it is, but what we have is news content that leans in the positive direction on average over uh, through the 90s leading up to, it's not that it's not already on a downward slope, it's, it's sloping downwards through the later 90s, but obviously 9-11 has a, has a uh, market effect. Then we're kind of bouncing along at a different equilibrium until, um, until the Great Recession. And then as we come out of the Great Recession through Obama years, uh, the tone gets a little bit more positive. And then it's on basically a slow and steady decline, at least in the Wall Street Journal from 2014 to the present. Here's what that looks like in the Washington Post. Now, right away, you're going to notice, I hope, the Washington Post is much more negative than the Wall Street Journal is from the mid 90s to the mid 2000s. Why, you might ask, is that the case? I cannot yet answer that. But it clearly is more negative. And we're going to do some tests to make sure that that's actually the, that that, that that's the case, that I'm not messing something up, that I don't have a crazy corpus in a little bit. But what you see is a Washington Post. Uh, the Washington Post content is on average more negative than the Wall Street Journal content. If what you're doing is opening up the Wall Street Journal 
or opening up the Washington Post for that decade in particular, you are reading generally happier content in the Wall Street Journal than you are in the Washington Post from the mid 90s to the mid 2000s. Though obviously through the 2000s, this is not very, not especially happy content in the Washington, uh, in the Wall Street Journal either. Then the two kind of trend pretty similarly together um, from 2008 onwards. Can only get the Washington Post, unfortunately, back to 1996 and ProQuest. That's why the why that's why it starts late. We can get the New York Times through the whole period, and the New York Times uh, exhibits behavior that I also cannot yet quite explain. For instance, the New York Times in the early 1990s is markedly more positive than it is from 1995 onwards, and and this for me is a is is a concerning shift because it doesn't correspond to, first of all, a shift that we also see in the Wall Street Journal. It doesn't correspond to something in the real world that I expect would have that big a, that dramatic effect, uh, an effect on, on, the, on the sentiment of news. And I can't, you know, we, we can't yet tell, the diff tell whether this is, on the one hand, a change in what the New York Times puts in their front section, as in the structure of the newspaper changes, and something which used to be in the front section is no longer in the front section, or vice versa, and that changes the tone of the front section. That's one possibility. That there's some, that there was arts and leisure stuff that wasn't labeled as arts and leisure, and that used to just go in the front section as regular news, and then gets labeled as arts and leisure and moved into an arts and leisure section. We cannot preclude the possibility that, 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 that's, what's, that that's what's going on. The other possibility is this is actually what happened. That is that there was some editorial decision um, or just the way the world happened at the time. And that shifted the tone of New York Times content from positive to more negative. In the first case, I, I see that as a problem. Our population is changing and as a consequence, sentiment is changing. In the second case, it, the population, it, the second case is more interesting. The population is the same, but the sentiment is changing. We can't yet tell the difference between, uh, between those things. But after the New York Times drops, in that first period, it's very similar to what we see in the Washington Post through about a 10, 12, 15 year period. The Washington Post gets more positive towards the end of the, well, at the beginning and through the Obama administration, and the New York Times stays negative until basically the beginning of the Trump administration, at which point all three newspapers are moving together. Figuring out how much of this movement is real, the function of changing sentiment in a fixed population of articles, or I'm going to call it fake or flawed because we have a shifting population of articles, cannot yet tell. Let's focus, I just want to focus now on the 2002 to uh, 2020 period, just kind of zero in on this period and get a sense for the difference in what's going on with these, uh, with these newspapers. There are some level differences, right? There are some equilibrium differences and there are points at which equilibrium has changed in you know, newspapers. The New York Times shifts towards the end of the time period. The Washington Post goes through several different things, uh, several different versions of the Washington Post. Actually, month to month changes are, are, uh, cor are significantly correlated across all of these series. So there's something about uh, these kind of level shifts that is interesting and maybe problematic, I cannot tell, but even if we don't, I'm talking, not talking about any fancy filtering of the data, but if we just look at correlations here, what we get are correlations that are like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, in some instances 0 0.5. Uh, and so there are month to month changes. There's something kind of, I take that as an indication that there's something real going on in these data. It's a little bit easier to see when we get rid of the dots. Um, and so now I'm uh, getting rid of the dots so we can just kind of look the series in the face. Uh, you might wonder, is there something about presidents here? I kind of want to say that there is, but I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> As in, there does to me seem to be uh, in this period, three different relationships between these three newspapers. There is a positive Wall Street Journal and negative uh, uh, Post and Times through the Bush period. Then we have a positive Wall Street Journal and positive Washington Post and negative New York Times through the Obama period, relatively speaking. And then we have uh, all newspapers kind of pull up quite tight to each other at neutral at the beginning of the Trump administration and then a slow decline through that Trump administration. So there are three periods here that happen to, I won't, I'm gonna say happen, to correspond with presidential administrations, but there may be more, more there. And this is one of the things that we're interested in playing with, partly because of the partisanship of the newspapers. But the way these newspapers are arranged, except for the 
Well, I guess the Bush and maybe the Trump period, if we want to make a lot of those differences, that might be in line with what we would expect in terms of the partisanship of the newspapers. That is, when Republicans are in power, the Wall Street Journal is more positive than the others. The thing is, the Wall Street Journal is more positive than the others when Obama is in power, too. Uh, I'm going to kind of pull uh, pull the presidents out, look at these series, and ask uh, if we look at this time period, to what extent are these level differences across newspapers a function of just kind of different different topics being in the front section of the newspapers? As in, is this about newspapers talking about the same topics in different ways? like the economy is getting covered differently in one newspaper versus another newspaper? Or is this about the different contents of the front section of newspapers? I'm thinking it's mostly about the different contents of the front section of newspapers, that it's not the case that newspapers are systematically, let's say, misrepresenting the state of the economy. And there's a growing body of work, a small but growing body of work that argues um, for kind of reasonable representation of, for instance, policy trends or macroeconomics in, in media content. It would be worrying if what we revealed in this analysis was, you know, you get a totally different sense of the economy in the Wall Street Journal than you do in the New York Times. But of course, we can test that possibility. We can just yank out, for instance, the unemployment articles and say, what, are, what, what would this series, these series look like if we just looked at the unemployment articles? Now, there's a period in here when the Washington Post seems to be really positive through 2014 to about 2017. I can't, I can't quite account for that. But you, you'll note that when we just, when we, when we zero in on a specific topic, what we get are series where the levels are much more similar. Actually, the correlation between the series is not very different. The mean bivariate correlation between these series, about 0.35, is about the same as the mean bivariate correlation of the previous series you were looking at. But those level differences that are happening over time, my sense is because of the changing structure of section A, those level differences disappear. And what we see are series that look much more, much more similar to each, each other. This is the editorial section. Now, I, well, I have no editorial section for the New York Times, but you can see editorials really hover around the neutral point over the time period. They slope kind of slowly uh, upwards over the first half of this time period, slowly downwards over the latter half of the, of the time period, uh, and they're, they're not markedly different. So I take this too as another hint that the difference that we're seeing over time has to do with the different contents of section A as opposed to the different reporting on the same items. And that strikes me as an interesting, uh, interesting topic. Now you might be worried uh, in addition that there's something very peculiar about the Factiva series or rather the ProQuest series, that what we're doing is um, getting a peculiar result, level differences from new, for newspapers, for instance, that is a function of the way in which ProQuest is archiving the data or a function of their having access to shifting subsets of, of the data. Uh, and it, it looks like that's not the case. If we go back to our uh, Nexus Uni data, which we still have up until it stopped, we have it from 2000 until uh, just the beginning of this year. And we estimate exactly the same measure using the Nexus Uni data, which, which, is, which is Section A content. Nexus actually archives metadata for Section A. So we use their own metadata to identify Section A. And if we, do, if we look at that in the Nexus content versus the uh, ProQuest content, we have a very high R squared. You can see the levels are very, are very, very similar. We can do the same for the Washington Post. Now, the Washington Post, there is something in one of these corpuses that is not in the other. There is a level difference. And the, and the Washington Post that we're getting from ProQuest is more positive than the Washington Post that we're getting from Nexus Unity. And this, I suspect, has to do with a difference between the way in which we're identifying Section A and Nexus Uni versus what we can maybe not successfully, not properly pull out or put in to Section A when we're working with um, ProQuest. But that level difference seems to be kind of static throughout because the correlation between these two series is 0.87. So we're getting basically the same trend over time. If what we're interested in doing is, is looking at the trend over time and the way it relates to other trends over time, we get basically the same result using Nexus Uni or, or using the ProQuest system. But again, I see these principally as useful checks on 
the degree to which we are successfully extracting the right population of articles. And it looks to me like the like we're doing not a bad job with the New York Times over the period we also had LexisNexis content. There is something different about, about what's going on with the Washington Post, but it's static and different. This is what the, uh, this is focusing back on 2002 uh, onwards, this is what the mean across all the newspapers would look like. And although there are these level differences in newspapers, this trend is roughly what I expected going in. That is, we were going to see post 9-11 a slow uh, increase through the Obama years, then a flattening and then a decrease in recent years. And that's basically what we see in this time series, averaging those three newspapers together. It may be that by averaging them together, we are kind of, we were able to identify the signal amongst all that noise. It might be that all the, the noise and measurement that we see in the individual series kind of evaporates once we pile them together. And the more newspapers we add, the, the less it may matter that there are these peculiar, I'm gonna call them like archival effects. We may kind of fa factor out those archival effects, I'm not sure. Anyway, this is the series that, uh, that we were after from the get-go and uh, before I finish, let me give you two possible tests of the concurrent validity of this series. If what we are doing is actually capturing the sentiment of news content, we have the following two expectations. The first is, we think that economic news content should be, uh, should be affected by the economy, as in it should track, be correlated with the economy. If it's not correlated with economic measures, then that's a little peculiar. That would be at odds with most of the past literature and at odds with our expectations. Um, and so we're gonna estimate just a very, very simple error correction model here where we regress changes in sentiment at T on lagged levels and then changes and lagged levels of leading economic indicators from the, um, from the Federal Reserve. So it's just a very simple, let's just see if these things are correlated. We expect for upward change in sentiment to be positively related to upward change in leading economic indicators and vice versa. Concurrent test of validity number two, does this media coverage correlate with any measure of public mood? And what we're gonna use here is a very, very simple measure of public mood. Well, actually the one we're using is simple. It took a long time to get there. It's every poll asking essentially the right direction, wrong direction. Uh, question, like, do you feel the country is moving in the right direction or the wrong direction across many, many pollsters over an extended period of time. It's a kind of poll of polls series of public mood. Uh, and we're gonna estimate the same kind of a model where public mood is regressed on sentiment. Now, we wanna be careful. We're not arguing that public mood is driven by media content here, although that is what the model looks like. We'd, we'd be just as happy estimating it in the, in the other direction. That is that the, the sentiment of media could be driven by public mood. We suspect that this is a, and past work suggests that this is a, um, there's kind of bi-directional causality here, that media content drives public opinion, but also um, public opinion drives media content, not least because most of the polls come from newspapers and newspapers are reporting on those polls, but also because journalists have a sense for what the what the state of the world is and how people feel, and that finds its way into media content. Okay. The magnitude of the coefficients here is not really of any significance for us right now. All that matters is that we get statistically significant effects where we see them. So in the first column, we can see current changes in leading economic indicators are positively related to current changes in net sentiment. Here, we're looking at that unemployment measure of net sentiment averaged across newspapers. And we can see that when the when leading economic indicators are getting better, sentiment is getting better. And when leading economic indicators are getting worse, the opposite is true. And there's both a short-term changes effect and a long-term levels effect. There isn't a long-term levels effect in the next model, but there is a short-term changes effect. It is the case that net sentiment in the current month, the change in net sentiment is related to the, a change in public mood. So these might be the beginning of some uh, 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 of some causal modeling and some kind of building theories and tests of the relationship, the way in which news content responds to the state of the economy or the way in which the public mood responds to news content. But for now, we're pitching this just as like a small concurrent validity test, just to check to make sure that the series we're generating are correlating with the things that we would expect them to correlate with. And so now I want to close up. 
these are the series we've been looking at just um, from 2002 to the present. Uh, and here are some questions that we're thinking about going forward. The first, the most obvious, what accounts for variation over time? And those models that we've just seen are the beginning of that kind of a, an exploration. What is it that drives media content more positively, more negatively? When we look at the front section, does the state of the economy drive just the economic coverage? Or actually, is there like a, a kind of mood element to the state of the economy? Does newspaper coverage as a whole move upwards and downwards in response to the economy? or to other things we, we really uh, don't know. What accounts for variation across newspapers? My strong, my inclination right now is to believe that these peculiar shifts in newspapers over time are about identifying that section A population properly. But we don't exactly know that that's true. It may be that there were editorial decisions that moved uh, section A around as opposed to our failures um, with metadata, or it may be that there were real life changes in, in the way in which newspapers were reporting the world that produced a kind of long, a shift towards positivity for an extended period or a shift towards negativity. And we have to test those possibilities. What accounts for variation across articles? We've only been looking at monthly uh, values right now, but of course we can dive right into the article and we can run all kinds of uh, complex uh, analyses uh, trying to look at the different topics that are being uh, that are getting more positive or negative sentiment over time, uh, the way in which sentiment may be driven by the salience of one topic versus another. Sentiment obviously gets worse when there's a war, for instance, because there are more bad words when when we're reporting war, um, and so we need to play with uh, the way in which shifts in sentiment. Uh, reflect shifts in uh, the kind of uh, the other elements of articles. And then eventually we want to play with uh, the extent to which net sentiment reflects or affects public attitudes. And the, the one of the end goals of this project, one of the objectives is to uh, start to play over a very extended period of time with actually with data that can be aggregated at much lower levels, try to get a sense for the degree to which media coverage drives public opinion or media coverage reflects uh, public opinion. We think the literature, particularly the literature about media facts, which is, the, uh, which is what a lot of us are, which is what I and others in the project are working in, the literature on media effects tends to think of the media as affecting other things. But of course, they're reflecting other things just as much. And this kind of very long term data series combined with the public mood measure gives us an opportunity to really dive into those issues of bidirectional causality. And that is what I wanted to get through today. Thanks very much. So what is my uh, next best step? Should I have a look at the chat or the Q&A for questions? Yeah, so um, questions can be answered in either the Q&A and chat. And it actually looks like we just had one pop into the Q&A here. Do you want me to read them off for you, Stuart? Sure, that'd be great. Cool, absolutely. We've got a question from Lakshmi here. Uh, did you try looking at confounding factors? Like what? <laughs> right now, so the quick answer is yeah. Uh, and, I mean, the, and the principal confounding factor I'm interested in is that um, there are metadata problems when we're dealing with this much content. There are metadata problems that, um, that are pushing series positive and negative in, in ways that we didn't expect, as in we're something which is, should be in section A is not. Or, or vice versa. The the other, um, I mean, the other way in which I'm thinking about confounding factors is um, is that there are topics that come and go over time, and those topics have an impact on on the sentiment. And we we could model that, right? When we see sentiment moving downwards around 9/11, I mean, there's a reason for that. It's because there are a bunch of articles about 9/11, and we can, of course, we can capture those articles, and we can look at at, at the way those articles at what the sentiment of those articles looks like over time. So I think there are stories to tell about, for instance, what the sentiment of terrorism articles looks like coming out of 9-11 in the same way people are telling stories right now about the, like the sentiment of coronavirus articles and what that looks like, or the sentiment of Black, Life, Black Lives Matter articles and, and, and what that looks like. Those are two topics and metadata um, ways in which I'm thinking about confounding variables, but there may be others that I'm not sure if that was the that was what you were getting at or not. So let me know if I've failed. Yeah, they were they were wondering within respect to sentiment. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is my, these are my principal concerns. 
Okay, we've got another one. Is there a role for the relative ratio of economic news in each newspaper sources? Um, for the relative ratio of economic news in each of the newspaper sources. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's more economic news. So we know right off the bat that we, we know that um, uh, there's more economic coverage in the Wall Street Journal. And we also know that some of that economic coverage, even though it's not, um, it's neutral or negative, it can have a, it can end up on the positive side of the sentiment dictionary. One of the problems with zero as a neutral point in the sentiment dictionary is that zero is um, like it's the it's the it's the middle mathematically, <laughs> but not necessarily a neutral article when a human reads it. And actually, most of the work that we've done with this dictionary in the past suggests that it's a it's a kind of borderline positive article, or it's an article with a positive value that a human takes in as neutral. Like there are a limited number of positive words that come up in an article that is neutral, and and that's like the right neutral point. So then if you go to a domain like jobs, where there, there tends to be, there tend to be a few positive, positively valenced words associated with jobs, even in articles that are neutral when a human, that a human would call neutral, but the measure would put a little bit above neutral. If you, if what you have is, for instance, in the Wall Street Journal, a lot of content about employment, and all of that content comes with a greater number than average of positive words than what you get is this, uh, what looks like positive content in the Wall Street Journal. When what it is is economic content that has just dragged along with it a uh, slightly higher frequency of positive words. And so one way of getting around that would be to um, would be to kind of model what a newspaper looks like taking into account like use a actually model the tone of a newspaper taking into account the proportion of topics or separate out the economic content from the other content you see all newspapers look more positive when we when we looked at unemployment excellent um next question from ali um could changes in ownership or crises at a paper cause jumps in the data? Uh, Washington Post ownership changed around 2008. New York Times had a controversy about reporting on the NSA and the Bush administration. Not sure when. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that latter one. That's I'm going to have to Google that. Um, yeah, I, we expect these things matter. And, and there actually is, um, there isn't work done on sentiment per se and the ownership of newspapers, but there's good work done on um, on the way in which when conglomerates buy local newspapers, the um, uh, the amount of sentiment in the newspaper, not positive or negative, but the amount of sentiment or the amount of sensational news, let's say, increases. So we know that ownership matters and we know that editorial boards will decide to do things in more positive or negative ways. They may not be using the words positive or negative, but on, in ways that would produce more positive or negative content. And so my, my expectation is that ownership does matter. Excellent. Um, next question from Mohammed. Um, one quick thought. Could where these newspapers are based have an effect on the sentiment? Um, notice Washington Post had a big leap in 2007, 2008. Same kind of thing with government spending um, on contractors skyrocketed. Basically, there was more money in D.C. and as a result, more happiness. Yeah, that, that actually I saw I when I saw that line, my initial reaction was, oh, people in D.C. were really happy about Obama getting elected. <laughs> and all the things that came along with the Obama administration. And that's reflected in that newspaper. Note that that newspaper also becomes the most negative partway through the Trump administration. Um, so that kind of fit like the storyline that was in my head about the Washington Post, but I, I can't tell. Of course, we now have access to not just these three newspapers, we have access to many, many, many newspapers. So the ideal way to test that and we is now within our grasp, right? We, we take a decade of all the content of a hundred newspapers and attach the economics of uh, attach the economics of their region to the tone of the newspaper. That I think is a really interesting possibility. Excellent. We've got a couple of questions asking you about future plans that you have um, for this research. So the first one is: Do you how do you plan to measure public mood? Uh, example based off polling data or social media data? Oh, um, I think the the, I mean, the objective with public mood moving forward is to keep doing a kind of poll of polls measure, right? So polling firms are regularly asking a kind of general public mood question, and um, and we can 
uh, we can combine those polls in a way that accounts for differences in question wording and differences in what we, like house effects, the way in which different polling houses are sampling, for instance, produces slightly different estimates over time. But we can create a kind of poll of polls, um, and and that would be that, that that I think is what we're thinking about where, where public mood is concerned moving forward, mostly because. Uh, social media data, and I'm saying this actually based on, on where other work that Midas is uh, and others are funding. The social media data is um, doesn't really capture public mood. It's so a bunch of it's weirdos, <laughs> as in like the Twitter verse is not reality, and and getting it to look like reality is quite complicated. Uh, and uh, as long as we still have this measure of reality. <laughs> which I'm calling regular public opinion polling, let's just choose to accept that that's true. <laughs> as long as we have this, let's call it a slightly more uh, reliable measure of reality, I think we're, we're, we'll run with that. It would be terrific to be able to do this in, with something like Twitter data because it's so easily accessible, but uh, we're not at the point yet where we can do that and call it anything other than the, like we could have a Twitter mood, but not a public mood. As a, as a, as a heavy Twitter user, I don't think you want any of that. <laughs> it's really um, hard. Mood in Twitter is hard because this, people use weird spellings, and because there's uh, you can't use emojis or even a lot of words because there's so much sarcasm. And and computers are not good at sarcasm. And yeah, they don't do the nuance, right? Um, one other question here. Um, did you try to validate the model only by way of it matching with reality? Wait, let me, me reread that again. <laughs> um, did you try to validate the model only by the way it matches with the reality? Could it be used to predict future events? Yeah, it can. Uh, now, I mean, I'm not sure if, um, yeah, it, it can is the short answer. And so here are some examples. For instance, we used to run models um, during elections where, um, where, Every day we'd we'd sample news content, and we'd we'd estimate a model of the relationship between trends in in the, in the sentiment of reporting about leaders and trends in public support for those leaders. But because public opinion polling takes two or three days to because it takes a little while for information to appear in public opinion polling for people to learn about it for them to get a telephone call or a, or a survey and answer that survey whereas journalists are like hyper attentive and they're reporting on the day you get a lead between media coverage and public opinion as in you see a, a shift in 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 media coverage fairly reliably let's say two three days before you would see it in public opinion polling now note i'm not saying that's because media drives opinion sometimes it drives opinion it's just because we measure it more quickly Journalists are like out there right on the bus, literally on the bus, writing exactly what's going on. And now people are feeling and what crowds are doing when the bus pulls up. And because we get that in media content on the day and can analyze it on the day, we can see movement in media content before we're able to see it in the public opinion polling. And then you can do a kind of prediction three or four days out of where you think, where you think um, um, polling is gonna go. And so we can do that in, in that kind of election context using sentiment, if we can do that, and we can, then one might imagine we could predict what the mood of the country was gonna be next month. If we found that there was a, that media coverage systematically was leading um, public opinion by month, which might be too much to ask. Maybe all we can do is get a one week lead. There will be contexts in, in which a one week lead is interesting. I think actually there are also contexts in which the tone of media coverage does not match the public mood. And these, I think, are really, so in this case, like failures to predict, are really interesting. Those will be interesting moments. There are times, I think we can all look back over the last, let's say, six years and think of times when it, the public mood and the, and the media coverage seem to be at odds with each other. Uh, and I think those are kind of interesting moments. Absolutely. Take a look here. Nothing else in the QRA or chat right now, but I see Jag popped up. So, yeah, I, I was just, yeah, I, I thought I thought that we were coming to the end of the set of questions, and so I just came in to thank Stuart for a fascinating presentation and a good discussion with uh, 
you know, you got you got a lot of engagement. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. That was really useful. And thanks everyone for your questions. I'm gonna spend a half an hour writing all this down afterwards. <laughs> Gives us lots to do. Great. Thanks again and have a great Thanksgiving and see everybody next week. You thank bet. You. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye.